you know how sometimes the teachers will tell like one teacher will tell a student to bring a note to another teacher. Mm-hmm. And so this student ended up in the class and they came in, they walked in and saw me in there and I see them in there. I'm like, oh, it's <laughs> about to be bad. <laughs> What's going on, everybody? Thanks for joining us for season two of the Black Student Success Podcast, where we bring you insight and guidance from successful Black professionals and students. My name is Selvin, and of course, we appreciate all the support as well as getting into this next season. So let's get into our guests. Today, we've got Brad Butler, who is a school motivational speaker. So he's going to talk about his experiences and things that have gotten to where he at is now. So Brad, thanks for joining us. How are you doing today, man? Hey, what's good, Selvin? How you doing? I'm good. How are you? I'm chilling, man. I'm blessed with another day. There you go. There you go. Perfect. So let's let's get right into it. So let's ask the first question, which is, who is Brad Butler? Ah, oh, man, that's a loaded question. But uh, uh, Brad Butler, listen, I'm a I'm a motivational speaker, I'm an author, a student advocate, um, a speaker coach. I'm just a regular guy who figured out what his gift was and just started chasing that thing. So. Um, that's what just kind of led me to where I'm currently at today. So I'm just a, a guy who legitimately, the way I look at things is I, I want to leave this world better than I found it. Perfect. Perfect. That's a really good way to sum up everything too. Um, definitely. So now let's talk about kind of your upbringing. What was your, your family, um, you know, dynamic, like as you were growing up? Uh, well, I'm originally from Jersey city, uh, born and raised in New Jersey, but I was, uh, born in Jersey city urban area. Uh, I'm talking about Martin Luther King Drive. You know anything about Martin Luther King Drives in any city, any state you've been in? I don't know why they do Martin Luther King dirty like that, but <laughs> every street, it just is not what it's supposed to be, right? So um living on Martin Luther King Drive corner, Martin Luther King Drive and Warner, and, um, you know, just an urban, you know, community, uh, you know, poverty, you know, drug use going on all around us, uh, violence all, all going on around us. Um, a lot of ups and downs, you know, within the area, the community, the family, um, my mother and father to, to say it in the nicest way possible. My mother and my father were urban pharmacists and very popular urban pharmacists at that. And, you know, because of that, you know, it only leads you down one or two paths. Either you die or you go to jail. I was lucky in the sense that my father ended up going to jail. When he got home, he changed his life. He decided that he wasn't going to go back to jail anymore. He wasn't going to sell drugs anymore. He's going to go on straight and narrow. And that's exactly what he did. He hasn't touched drugs uh, as far as selling them ever since then. Um, But it caused some stress because he was going from making money hand over fist to now working a nine to five, getting paid, you know, every two weeks and struggling with the paychecks that are coming in. So it caused uh, my mother and my father to then fall to uh, as far as being a victim to uh, heroin. So they became heroin addicts and they were able to beat their addiction. Thankful, you know, for that, to God be the glory. They were able to uh, beat their addiction. And, you know, they were able to figure it out, get themselves back on track. My father never touched a drug again. My mom never touched a drug again. So we were good in that space. But after that happened, they figured it would be best to uh, send me with my father to the suburbs of East Windsor. So me and my father go out there. And within a few weeks of being in the system, I got thrown into special ed classes. I stayed in special ed classes for about 10 years. Um, So struggling through that, being told I couldn't go to college, couldn't play college football, um, the things that I just wasn't capable of doing. They kind of tried to force feed me uh, different things. Oh, do this, do that. You'll be good at this. You'll be good at that. I was like, man, you know, I don't like being told what to do. Like, I want to make my own decisions about my life. And um, when I had the opportunity, when I graduated from high school, I said, I'm going to go to college. So I started off with Mercer County Community College, went there. Then um, I graduated from there, uh, transferred over to Kane University, KU, yeah. uh, with the Kane University, got my bachelor's there. And now um, after I graduated, I realized I had a gift for speaking. So I started my business you know, while I was at Kane. I also played football as well. So that was good. Shout out to Kane University and the football team. But um, I realized I had a gift after I graduated from Kane. Uh, I started my speaking business, got a mentor, went to work on that. And um, that's what led me to where I'm currently at. So I've had my business for almost six years now. And now I'm actually back in school working on my master's degree. I'll be done um, in, I believe, May of next year. 
All right. Well, congratulations uh, being back on that path and a lot of adversity, it looks like that you face, especially being, um, you know, being what your surroundings were and, you know, having that adjustment, um, even with your surroundings. And then, you know, like you said, getting into, you know, place into those classes and, you know, I'm sure not even just the actual work of trying, trying to get to it, but just maybe the stigma of being in those classes, I'm sure is something that you had to overcome. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, the name call and, you know, you get ca- called every name in the book and, um, you know, we're, you're, you're hiding basically from people. Like you don't want people to know that you're in those classes. You know, that's just, it's like, man, it's embarrassing. You, you over there somewhere and you, it's like, oh man, you getting called dumb, stupid, retarded, remedial, you know, you anything they could think of, you know how kids are, you know, mm-hmm. they don't know any better. So, you know, they just follow what other kids are doing. Right. But, um, you know, I, I believe it's kind of like a gift and a curse because, you know, going through those hardships, it, it built a lot of resiliency in me. And, um, you know, I, I'm able to take 100 no's, you know, before I get a yes. J- that's just how I'm built. So, um, you know, like I said, gift and a curse. There's some yeah. good in it and it's also some bad in it. But, you know, you, you, you take the good with the bad and you make the best of it. Absolutely. It's, it's one of those good ways of being built where you can handle rejection because you're always going to get rejection and especially kind of being in that entrepreneurial space where you're running your own business. You know, you'll, you'll get your fair share of that. So I think you like that's part of that gift, being able to handle those different things. So I'm sure part of that upbringing and all those things that you've overcome have been part of the motivation of your career path as a speaker. But what would you say is, you know, the, some of those main pieces of why you you know took this path well the the reason why i took this path is because um i I legitimately just want to be the i want to be what i wish i had when i was a kid like i didn't have any examples like i was i was uh, a black kid in a suburban neighborhood and I was one of the only black kids on the block, like in the whole, like, you know, it, there really wasn't a whole lot that were around. And, you know, I got stuck in a weird space because, you know, I was in the suburban area, like a cul-de-sac. Right. And it was like, I wasn't black enough to be a part of the black crowd anymore. And I'm not white enough to be with the white crowd. So now I'm stuck in the middle in this gray area. And I don't really know where I fit in because, you know, growing up, my mom always taught me, you know, pronounce your words properly. If you don't know the word, like if you don't know a word or the definition, go look it up in the dic- uh, the dictionary. My grandmother always carry, uh, had her, her dictionary in her th- uh, thesaurus, God rest her soul. Like I keep it right over here. Like that's one of my treasured uh, possessions from my grandmother before she passed her thesaurus and her dictionary, right? So I always tried to make sure I knew the the proper use of a word and uh, the definition for the word, like that type of thing. So when I would get around certain people and I started using words that they weren't used to, it's like, oh, you be hanging around with them white kids. Oh, you over there with them, but this is not, or whatever. Or, or, and I'll get with the black kids and maybe I didn't uh, curse as much or I wasn't into some of the same things that they were into. It's like, oh man, you ain't, you ain't with us. Like you ain't part of it. Like you don't, you don't do this, doing that. I'm like, bro, that's just not what I'm into. But, you know, I'm just so glad that I, I found a, uh, some friends that I was actually tight and cool with. Like my, my best friend, Sam Salter, like me and him thick as thieves, bro. Like we just were those types. We were just like, yo, this is what it is. This is how we are. And we, we going to rock together. Like we going to be bros. So you know, we don't never have to worry about what other people say. So that that's kind of, you know, what that was as far as that goes. Yeah. Yeah. And then and having having those positive influence, I'm sure that you're able to see even some of those kids maybe that you um, are, you know, are speaking to that you could relate to as well. And maybe even some of them have come up to you after you're speaking and say, you know, that, you know, that really uh, that really moved me. You know, I was, you know, felt like I was just like you in, in some of the sense. So I'm sure that's rewarding in itself, you know, being that that's part of your personal uh, story. And, and and being able to, to captivate those individuals. Oh uh, yeah, uh, absolutely. It, it's a definitely a rewarding feeling when you know the students or the the educators um, when they come to you afterwards and they tell you that hey man, this is exactly what the students needed. Or the students say, man, like I I, I thought I was alone. Like I thought I was the only one who felt like this. And you know, being able to see you or hear your story, it lets me know that being in special ed classes is not a death sentence. 
Absolutely. Perfect. Perfect. So um, I know that you mentioned some of the obstacles that you had as you were growing up. So let's even take a focus on some of those obstacles that you had either while you were in college or as you were building up your speaking business. Um, Can you talk about some of those things that you ran into and then how you overcame those? Yeah. uh, So as far as college, the the difficulties that I I ran into with that was um, it it really was surrounded by me addressing the weaknesses that I had. Right. Like I hadn't really wrote essays and, you know, real, real papers. So I remember the first paper that I wrote in in college, I got like a D minus on it. I handed it in like a day late and, you know, the, the work wasn't satisfactory. So, you know, the, the, the professor told me if you have any chance at all uh, of passing this class, like you're going to need to go, go see a tutor you're like because this ain't going to get it. You're like I, I will fail you. And I was like, all right, cool. So I picked I packed up my stuff. And I just went to the uh, the tutor's uh, office. And I went there. I said, listen, I need help. Like, I'm not going to make it through this class if, if I don't figure this out. And I worked with them and they helped me to build on my writing skills, my reading and comprehension so that the next time when I had a paper that was due, I was ready for it. So I took that approach with all my, my classes, even now with uh, the master's classes that I'm in. And as far as my business, the, the thing that I learned that has helped me the most is that Brad your speaking ability is not enough. Like I could be the best speaker in the world. I could be better than Tony Robbins, Eric Thomas, Inky Johnson, Les Brown, you name them. I could be better than all of them. But Brad, if you do not have a system, like if you don't have a system together that helps you get in front of the right people, there's no point in you doing it. Like at that point, you're just talking. You're not doing business anymore. So yeah, that those are the two things that I found within my, my college career and my business that just stood out and was like, okay, this is something that by making these adjustments has helped me to get to where I'm currently at. Yeah. Yeah. One, I think one thing that stands out is on the, on the business side, just not being good at one thing. Um, and you know, uh, you know, knowing that when it comes to running a business, um, you know, you have your talent, you know, you, that's, that's undeniable. That's something that you can't take away from somebody. Um, but some of those things that you might have to build up. And I think it might, maybe it helped that you did go to school for business that you were able to kind of put those things together. Um, when it comes to the system, you know, like you said, getting from the right people, whether it's the, the networking that gets into place, if it's, you know, the, the marketing or whatever the case is. And, it, and, it, and hopefully it wasn't too far into it that you found out that those were the things that you need to put together to make sure that, you know, people can see how talented you are. And, and I think that's really good for some of our uh, you know, audience members to hear that, you know, so that they can be more well-rounded, which it sounds like you've gotten to a point. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Perfect. So now um, just a few other questions just to kind of get to know you a little bit better. Um, You know, name uh, one embarrassing thing that happened to you when you were in school. Oh, man. One embarrassing thing that happened to me when I was in school. Man, I honestly can't really think of too many embarrassing (laughs) things that happened to me while I was in school. Like I was... I was even though I was in special ed classes, I was popular in a sense where because I played sports and stuff. So um, I can't really think of anything that really made me feel like embarrassed. Um, I, I mean, obviously, aside from, you know, if somebody found out I was in special ed classes. Mm. Um, so I guess I'll, I'll say this. Um, I had this thing where um, there were a lot of girls who. You know, before I had my, I got my uh, like a long term girlfriend in, in um in high school. There were a lot of girls that like they liked me and wanted to talk to me, but they always thought that like I was like, yo, Brad, I think he's too good for somebody or whatever. Like he don't want to talk to me. Like this is that, and like they would try to come like walk with me or walk me to class and stuff, and I wouldn't let them because I was going to special ed classes, <laughs> and I couldn't let them see where I was going. So I would do like, I'll come up with something new every day. Like, nice. I, you know, I grab my books or something like that from my locker. And then I'm like, oh, you know, I think such and such calling you. And then it's like, oh, who? And they'll turn around. I'm like, no, I'm out of there. <laughs> so that, in, the, in a sense, that's, that was embarrassing to me, you know, yeah, those situations. Hey, I'm sure that made you uh, a really creative person as you were, <laughs> as you were growing up. What's probably like the most creative excuse that you came up with if you can think of it real quick most creative excuse oh man 
Let's see. Let's see. Most creative excuse. Oh, man. You know what? Somebody came into one of the classes, right, that I was in. So I'm Ooh. sitting there, like, doing work like I'm, I normally would. And one of the students who I knew, right, like a, somebody was like an acquaintance, somebody I knew, somebody I'm cool with, they, you know how sometimes the teachers will tell, like, one teacher will tell a student to bring a note to another teacher? Mm-hmm. And so this student ended up in the class, and they came in. They walked in and saw me in there, and I see them in there. I'm like, oh, it's about to be bad. <laughs> so when they asked me about it later, like, what were you doing in there? I was like, oh, man, I got in trouble because I did something, or I said I cut somebody out or whatever. I got in a fight or something. So they made me stay in there and do my work for the rest of the day. Like, it's stupid, man. I know. Like, <laughs> I'm sure he believed it. <laughs> they probably did because so, like stuff like that would actually happen. And be like, oh mm-hmm. man, no, you got to stay over there with this teacher because you acted up all day. Like you, you know, you got to go over there. So, uh, yeah. So I'm, I get me might have might have slid through. I don't know. I'm sure some people did find out I was in special ed classes. I'm sure when people see me now, they'd be like, oh yeah, he was over there in them trailers, wasn't he? Like, well, well look at him now. <laughs> it's like, ah man, I guess. That's what's up. That's what's up. All right. And then lastly, um, we all have this one thing that'll get our black card revoked, whatever that (laughs) whatever that tends to be. What would you say is that one thing for you? Uh, The one thing that would get my black card revoked. Um, Hmm. Ah, man, I probably I might have a few. Tell you the truth. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> um, I know how to play spades. I'm just not a fan of playing the game mm. because it gets too serious for me. And you start throwing cards in front of my face and all that. And I'm like, come on, bro. Really? Yeah. Like, do we really have to go? Do we really got to go through this? Uh, it just gets too intense for me. I'm like, come on. Like, it's a card game. So I don't really I know how to play spades, but I'm just not a fan of playing spades. Um, let's see. Is there anything else? Um, I like chicken. I like watermelon. Uh, <laughs> let's see. Uh I know how to do the electric slide. Um, I'm trying to think, is there anything else that stands out? Um, I don't like, cl- uh, let's see, I don't like clubs. I don't like, um, I don't like things that waste, I feel like are a waste of time. Mm-hmm. So there are some things that are part of our culture that we tend to indulge in that I don't because I feel like it's a waste of time. And I'm not blame. I'm not against anybody or, or, you know, looking down on anybody because I used to do those things. Like I used to go to the club. I used to party and do all I don't do it now, but I recognize that there are some people who do it uh, and they've passed the age group that they should probably be doing it in. And it's like, <laughs> I, I like I walked away from it earlier, like when I was like 23 or 24. Mm-hmm. Like I was like, I'm done. I did all that. I, like, I went to the club. I did everything I wanted. I'm good. So I don't need to do that no more. I'm good. But um, yeah, some people still kind of there. And I, I know some people kind of, yeah, some of our people just kind of gravitate to it. Um, and I think it's probably because of what we see on TV, what's marketed to us. Mm-hmm. So I don't necessarily entirely blame, you know, that them for that. It's just like, eh, you're, it's, it's your exposure thing. I've been exposed to some things that yeah. made me feel like, ooh, wait, there's another world out there. I don't have to do X, Y, and Z. I don't have to be a rapper. I don't have to, you know, be an athlete or this or that or whatever. I can be an entrepreneur. I can be a business owner. So... Um, yeah, like real, like the whole how, real, was it real wise of Atlanta and all that stuff? Like, I, I, I ain't watching that stuff. I can't yeah. do it. <laughs> like, so, I don't want to see, I don't want to see another slave movie. I'm good. I'm yeah. just, I'm good yeah. on all that. <laughs> we, we, we know, we know. So, so we're not going to find Brad, you know, in the club doing the same old two stuff. Nah, nah. <laughs> I'm, I'm, like, may, so, so if it was like a, a big celebration or something like that for maybe a friend or like a family member or a close friend, uh, and it maybe it was like a lounge, maybe I might do something like that. And that's a that's a maybe, right? Mm-hmm. But no, club sweaty and they, I, I can't even understand the words to the songs. <laughs> I'm next to the speaker, I can't hear people spilling drinks. I, and I don't drink, so I don't even really want to be around it. So, yeah, I'm like, I'm good, I don't drink and I don't smoke. So, like, you know, when you don't do certain stuff, you don't really go around that type of stuff. So, exactly. 
just is what it is. There you go. Unless you're designated driver or something. <laughs> something uh, like I mean, yeah, like I, you know, I ain't gonna let my people's just I'm like, all right, I'm coming. I'll come get you. Like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> cool, cool. All right. Well, Brad, well, thank you. That's all I got for you. I, I truly appreciate your time here. Any last words and then where people can find you? I'm gonna give you the floor for that. Um, last words. Um, I, I just want people to know, especially the students out there that, you know, I know things have not necessarily gone your way as far as, you know, academia and sports and things of that nature. But listen, I need you to understand that delayed is not denied, right? Chances are there's, there was a situation, a scenario, something out there that you were being protected from. And you got to look at it that way. Maybe you should not have been on campus because things might not have gone right. There might have been an issue that went awry. So it's better for you to have been home doing your virtual classes. But now that the opportunity is about to open up again for you to go back to those classes, you have to appreciate the opportunity to be on campus and be around those educators and professors who are going to help you to get to the next level and help you to succeed. So just understand that, yes, you it was delayed, right? You weren't able to do it when you wanted to do it, right? But delayed is not denied. So now that you have the, the opportunity to get back on campus and do the things that you, way you were used to doing or the way that you wanted to do it, just make sure you have an attitude of gratitude when you step on that campus. And when you signed on that dotted line saying that you were going to go to that school and get your degree, don't leave until you get it. There you go. There you go. Perfect, perfect words. Well, thank you, Brad. Um, let us know where, pe where people can find you. Ah, oh, man, all social media platforms, Brad Butler the second. So like Instagram is Brad Butler, the two and D the second. And then, of course, if you want to book me for any speaking engagements, you can catch me at www.bradbutler, the number two dot com. Perfect. All right. Well, thanks again for for sharing your insight and your um, your story. And, and thanks to everybody who is listening, watching. Uh, be sure to check us out at inquirehire.com. And we're also on social media. That's at inquirehire. So until next time, peace.